All right. Uh, I have some background noise here. Do, can you hear it? Can you hear it? It's only going to be for a second. Okay. Uh, Vicki said it will only be for a second, but I don't know how she knows because it's coming from outside. No, I know what we're doing out Okay. Okay. She knows. All right. The Synoptic Gospels. First of all, lower and higher criticism. Just to familiar, familiarize yourself with these terms. Uh, now, we're going to be using the term criticism uh, to describe looking at the scriptures from an unbiased, fair-minded viewpoint. Um, when we talk about critical thinking, we could also use the term, excuse me, analytical thinking. We analyze, we, uh, we think things through, and uh, that's what we mean in terms of criticism. There are two broad-based kinds of criticism. One is called lower criticism, and this is what we've done in textual criticism. Lower criticism is textual criticism. Higher criticism deals with the questions of authorship, the social setting, the date, and so forth uh, of the books that we're going to be looking at. So this is the kind of criticism that we're going to be looking at largely in terms of this class. All right, the nature of the gospel literature. Now, we're all familiar with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, all of us are very familiar with their content, but as we study the Gospels in this class, uh, let us as much as possible see if we can come to them as if we've never read them before. Try to come with a clean slate and really come with open eyes, because so often things get so familiar that they don't really penetrate. We don't really see the importance of what is there and the uh, radical nature of some of it. So let us try to come uh, as much as we can uh, with an open heart and um, as if we've not read it before. Now, what kind of literary works are the Gospels? There's been a lot of debate about what kind of literature the Gospels actually are. And there are three primary options. One, a kind of ancient biography, much like the biographies of the Greco-Roman world. Uh, of course, they're not identical with ancient biographies, but scholars like Burridge believe that they are close enough to be put in that category. Uh, another is historical monographs. Uh, so others say, no, the Gospels are not just about Jesus, but they're more about what God is doing through Jesus. So the story itself is central, not the person of Jesus himself. So in a, in a biography, it's the person that's central. In a historical monograph, it's the story that's central. The third option is that of a unique genre. Uh, people like Francis Watson and Martin Hingle believe that the Gospels are a completely new genre. They do bear resemblance to ancient biographies, uh, but the differences are so substantial that these scholars believe that uh, they should be considered a completely different genre, unlike others. Uh, Hingle calls them charismatic biographies. So which is it? The Gospels probably incorporate aspects of all three. I would say probably number three, a unique genre that bears some resemblances to ancient biography and historical monograph. Now the word gospel means good news. And the Gospels are just that. They are the good news about Jesus Christ. 
They are accounts of the church's proclamation of its preaching. In the New Testament, the word gospel refers to what is spoken. So the gospel is, is the, the gospel uh, message. But toward the end of the first century, the word gospel came to be used for the good news of Jesus in written form. Justin Martyr was the first to use this term in the plural, referring to the individual books called gospels. So the word gospel has two basic meanings. One is the good news that is spoken, the gospel message, this what, how, what we would put into a sermon. And the other meaning of gospel is a written work about Jesus. The term evangelist meant one that preaches the good news, the evangel, the euangelion. So the, uh, the gospel is the evangel, and evangelist is one who preaches the evangel. Uh, it wasn't until the third century that the word evangelist came to mean a gospel writer, uh, a writer of the uh, euangelion uh, in written form. The gospel writers never would have thought of their story of Jesus as simply an attempt to pre preserve for posterity what otherwise would have been lost. It was more than uh, just for keeping the memory of Jesus alive. For them, Jesus was not just a historical figure to be remembered. He was the living Lord to be experienced. James Denny said, no apostle, no New Testament writer ever remembered Christ. Rather, they experienced his presence daily. So, for them, Christ was not just a historical figure. He was that, but he was much more. He was the living Lord with whom they had uh, experience every day. Also, the Gospels were first written for the purpose of presenting Christ in such a way that the readers would come to faith in him and be saved. John wrote in his Gospel, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, in John 20, 31. Luke wrote for a man named Theophilus, and his, name, his aim for Theophilus was to know the certainty of the things you have been taught, uh, to quote him in Luke 1, 4. Luke wanted to confirm the faith of Theophilus. So we see that the Gospels are theological documents. They are interpreted history. Besides giving us history, they give us the saving message of Jesus Christ. And this is true because simple historical facts are not enough when it comes to Jesus. There are people who know the Gospels much better than you or I do, and yet they don't have faith. Scholars like Rimaris and Strauss have written about the Gospels, but they wrote to discredit the Gospels. They wrote from a hatred of it. So the, the, the biblical writers were men of faith, imparting their faith to others. So are they historical documents? Yes, they are. It is history, but it is more than that. It is interpreted history. It is history for the purpose of bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ. Do you have questions or comments here before we go on? Yes, doctor. Yes, go ahead. Um, I have a question. I, I've heard the word gospel or evangelion was, and I've read somewhere else too, that what used 
it, it was kind of a royal device when the emperors or or kingdoms announces uh, something related to the royal family. It was not a, gener a generic word, but it was more like dedicated to to a specific sort of news, not just any news, but news that were uh, related to something happening or something changing in the kingdom, like a newborn is, a new king is born, or uh, the emperor is dead or things like that. So uh, what is your, your, your opinion about that? Are you agree with it? Or it was a different way to use the word gospel in, in, in those days? Yes, the word gospel was not just a religious word. Um, the word gospel was used in the Roman Empire to announce uh, good news about the emperor. So the, uh, uh, the news about a, a particular military victory would be called the, the euangelion. Uh, the uh, celebration of the emperor's birthday, that kind of thing would be, uh, would be called euangelion, would be called gospel. And we are going to see that much of our terminology that we have in the New Testament was used by the Roman Empire. The emperor was called Savior. Uh, the emperor was called Lord. The news about the emperor, gospel. Um, and so many of the terms that we use in uh, the New Testament were also used by the Roman Empire to uh, give a much different gospel. So when the, the New Testament believers said, Jesus is Lord, kurios Jesus, they were in effect saying, Caesar is not Lord. So to say Jesus is Lord was a religious statement but it was also a political statement. It was a statement that said, the true Lord of this world is not the emperor. And today we could say it is not um, Joe Biden in America, or it's not uh, Duterte, or it's not any of the others. The true Lord is Jesus Christ. So uh, yeah, it's, it's good to bring that, that up, Gustavo. Uh, not only was it a religious term, it was also a secular term. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions or comments? All right, let's look at references to Jesus outside the Gospels. Of course, the Gospels are our primary sources of in, in, information about Christ's life. There is very little written about Jesus uh, outside the, the New Testament in secular uh, contemporary sources, but there is some, and they confirm that Jesus lived and that the church came into being shortly after his death. Uh, so there are sources besides the New Testament that talk about Christ. Uh, here are some different sources that we can look at outside the Gospels. Uh, first of all, the Agrafa. The Agrafa are sayings of the earthly Jesus that are not written in the four canonical Gospels. They may be found in New Test the New Testament outside the Gospels. They may be found in textual variants of later manuscripts in the church fathers or in other collections. An example of agrafa within the New Testament uh, would be Acts 20.25. 20, well, I thought I had it in PowerPoint. I guess I don't. But there, uh, Paul is quoted, quoting Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus said that. Paul tells us he did, but it doesn't appear in the Gospels. Clement of Alexandria gives uh, this quotation, ask for the great things, and God will add to you what is small. 
Origen uh, gives this saying, be approved money changers. So there are sayings of Jesus from orthodox sources, either in the New Testament or among the church fathers, that, um, that are sayings of Christ, or at least purported to be sayings of Christ. Now, there's no doubt that what Paul said is a true saying of Christ. Probably those from Clement of Alexandria and Origen and others also uh, came from Christ. We also have collections of sayings. Uh, the greatest collections of these sayings that supposedly came from Jesus are the Oxyrhynchus papyri and the Gospel of Thomas. The Oxyrhynchus papyri. I was, uh, I was taking a course on the life of Christ in seminary, and Dr. E.F. Harrison was my teacher, and he mentioned the Oxyrhynchus papyri. And somebody raised their hand and said, how do you spell that? And he said, well, just like it sounds, O-X-Y-R-H-Y-N-C-H-U-S. <laughs> now, uh, to me, that's really funny because, you know, who would guess that's the way you spell it just from hearing it? Um, the Oxyrhynchus papyri are a series of papyrus manuscripts found in Oxyrhynchus, Egypt in 1897. Some of these manuscripts have been identified as copies of the Greek text of the Gospel of Thomas. And uh, the Gospel of Thomas is a Gnostic document written probably uh, quite a while after the uh, genuine Gospels of the New Testament were written. Uh, we already mentioned the Gospel of Thomas when we covered the canon. It is part of the Nag Hammadi collection of documents discovered in Nag Hammadi, Egypt in 1945 and 46. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas claims to be a collection of sayings of Jesus. They communicate a Gnostic theology, although it's debated whether it was originally Gnostic or whether somebody Gnosticized it uh, at a later time. There are 114 sayings, or logia, uh, 40 of which are entirely new. Others are similar uh, to the genuine sayings of Jesus, but with some kind of change made. Some are very similar to the genuine sayings, and some have no parallel in the uh, canonical gospels. Are these sayings genuinely from Jesus? Generally, I would say no. There might be the possibility that some of them go back to a genuine saying, uh, but we cannot establish that. And if it does, how do we know that they have not been changed from their original form? So we do not need to consider this book, the Gospel of Thomas, for our Bible. It was certainly written after the canonical Gospels, probably sometime in the second century. It draws from many parts of the New Testament, which shows that it was written after uh, the New Testament corpus uh, had uh, been already formed. And then we have apocryphal gospels. We, we mentioned the New Testament apocrypha before. Uh, Gundry calls these apocryphal gospels a motley picture of heretical beliefs and pious imagination. So um, we do have some genuine quotes of Jesus in the, in the Agrippa, but in the Oxyrhynchus papyri, the Gospel of Thomas, uh, the Nag Hammadi collection, uh, or the Apocryphal Gospels, there's probably very little that would be a genuine saying of Christ. All right, studying the Gospels. Here we're going to be looking at three different kinds of, of criticism. 
uh, source criticism, form criticism, and redaction criticism. So first of all, source criticism and the Gospels. And here we have the synoptic problem. How many of you are familiar with the synoptic problem? Let me see your hand. No one. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm getting some noise. Is that, uh, does somebody have their... Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, when we look at, at the Gospels, we see that three of them are very similar. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which we call the synoptic Gospels. And um, I have this little cartoon here. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, see me after class. Your book, report, your book reports are surprisingly similar. Um, here we're going to deal with the interrelationships between the Gospels. There is some kind of relationship because whole sections of the Gospels are the same, word for word. At other times, one Gospel gives a story that one or both of the others don't contain. What is this relationship? The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are much more similar in content to one another than uh, the Gospel of John. So we deal with those three as a group. They are called the synoptic Gospels. Uh, synoptic comes from the two words uh, in the Greek, soon, uh, which means together, and optic, which means to see. So it refers to the same viewpoint from which these Gospels together view the life of Christ. Uh, to study the relationship of the Gospels, uh, a tool that really comes in handy is a Gospel synopsis. And uh, I would like to mention three. Uh, the first one is Kurt Allen's, uh, it's called Synoptis Quatuor Evangelorum, and it's, it's in Greek. Uh, so you would need to know Greek if you use that. The second is Kurt Allen's synopsis of the four Gospels, Greek-English edition of the synopsis Quatu, Quatuor Evangelorum. So this one has Greek on one page, and the facing page has the English. Uh, it also has all four Gospels. It includes John. And of the, the ones that I would mention, I would recommend this one uh, most highly. The third one is uh, Throckmorton's Gospel Parallels, a synopsis of the three Gospels in English. And that is from the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, synopses put the gospel accounts into parallel columns. Often they contain only the synoptic gospels, but sometimes they contain John as well. So it's an easy way to compare the gospels because you have three columns and you can look right across and see how they each one give a particular saying or story of Christ. Um, do we have a question or comment here from anyone? Uh, yes, doctor. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, it's me again. All right. Uh, I'm just, I just, just for, uh, what is the difference between a synopsis and a harmony? It's, is it the same idea or, or not? Uh, no, they, they are different. Synopsis is a three or four column work that gives, it'll give Matthew in one column, Mark in, an, in the another, Luke in another, John in okay. another. So now a, a harmony um, tries to blend the stories all together into uh, one seamless story. Okay. Okay. Now, in order to make this confusing, 
synopses are sometimes called harmonies. Now, we don't need that, do we? <laughs> but unfortunately, sometimes people call uh, synopses harmonies. Uh, technically, they're not. Uh, harmonies are putting the story of Christ into one story. Often it is done with the idea of getting rid of what seem like contradictions. Uh, they want everything to look exactly the same. Uh, now, in order to do that, they have to repeat certain stories. Uh, for example, Jesus goes across the, the sea and he meets a demoniac. He casts the, the demons out of the demoniac, demoniac and puts them into a herd of swine, pigs, and they go down the, the hill and are drowned. And the people from the city come out and say, uh, please leave us. And so Jesus does. So there's, there's one demoniac. Now, in order to get rid of a problem, because there's a different account, Jesus goes across the sea, and he meets up with two demoniacs. He casts the demons out of the two demoniacs. The demons go into the pigs. The pigs go down the hill and drown. The people come out of the, of the city and ask Jesus to leave, and he does. Do you really think that happened twice? I doubt it. I doubt it. I, I think that it's probably two different ways of telling uh, this story. Uh, one includes, one just tells of one demoniac, one tells of two, but it's one happening. Um, Stein tells a, a, about a man by the name of Andreas Osiander, who wrote A Harmony of Jesus' Life, published in 1537, he has Jesus raising uh, Jairus' daughter twice, healing the blind man in Jericho four times, being crowned with thorns twice, and Peter warming himself by the fire and denying the Lord four times. And there have been modern day uh, books that have done the same thing. Harold Lenzel wrote a book in the 1970s called Battle for the Bible, where he does the same kind of thing, um, trying to smooth out different accounts of, of Jesus' uh, sayings or happenings there in the Gospels. That's a harmony. A synopsis, on the other hand, has the columns, okay? Um, here is a picture of the uh, Synopsis Quatuor Evangelorum of Peter's healing, uh, of Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law. Notice the, the main uh, heading there is in German, but to the right there, it says the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, and it gives Matthew, Mark, and Luke in, uh, in the Greek. Now, here is uh, Throckmorton's Gospel Parallels, the story of Jesus' baptism. And of course, this is in English from the NRSV. So as you, as you look it over, you can see Matthew is much longer than Mark or Luke. And you can compare and see how they um, compare to one another. Let's look at some facts about the Gospels the three synoptic gospels. Look at the common subject matter. Mark has 661 verses. Matthew has 1,086. Luke has 1,149. Of the 661 verses in Mark, 606 of them are found in Matthew. 350 in Luke. Over 90% of Mark's verses are found in Matthew. In Luke, over 50% of Mark's verses are found in Luke. So 95% of Mark's verses are found in either Matthew or Luke. The 
there's also the common use of language. In terms of actual words, uh, Mark has 1,025 words. Matthew has 97.2% of Mark's actual words. Luke has 88.4% of Mark's actual words. Jesus spoke in Aramaic, and yet there is great uniformity uh, in the Greek language here. You know, Greek sentences uh, do not de depend on word order very much. It's almost like you could take the Greek words, throw them up in the air, and where they land, you could still read the sentence. Doesn't depend on word order. Uh, and yet, even the word order is identical in many places uh, between the Gospels. There is also the common outline and order. The sequence of Mark's outline is followed by uh, both of the others. So uh, Mark has an order. Matthew varies from that order at times. Luke varies from that order at times, but never do they agree in that variation. So there is no place where Matthew and Luke agree in arrangement against Mark. We call this the Markan framework, that it appears that Matthew and Luke uh, varied from. So there clearly is some kind of interdependence. So what is the relationship then between uh, the three Gospels? Let's look at some proposed solutions. Now remember this, what we're talking about here is the synoptic problem. First of all, there is the two-source uh, hypothesis. Um, this is the most accepted of the synoptic, uh, of the solutions to the synoptic problem. Mark was written first. Matthew and Luke used Mark. Matthew and Luke also used another document or saying source called Q which we'll consider in a minute. So this position depends on uh, the belief in two sources. Mark and priority, Mark is one source and Q is the other source. So Mark, by Mark and priority, we, we mean that Mark was written first, the first gospel to be written. Uh, Stein gives uh, a number of arguments for Mark and priority. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on these, but the argument from length. Uh, some have said that Mark is an abridgment of Matthew, but Mark is hardly an abridgment. Where Matthew and, Luke, uh, and Mark have the same story, it's normally longer in Mark than it is in Matthew. Where there are parallel stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Mark is often the longest. It makes more sense that Matthew and Luke used Mark and supplemented it than to think that Mark took those Gospels and made an abridgment of it. Uh, a Reader's Digest version of it. Uh, why would he edit out some of the most important parts? The Sermon on the Mount, uh, the great parables of, uh, of Luke. So the first is argument from length, argument from grammar, uh, just to say that Mark has rougher grammar. The others have smoother grammar. It would hardly go the other way. Argument from difficulty. 
Uh, remember, in textual criticism, the harder reading is preferred. Well, it also goes here. Um, examples like negative descriptions of the disciples, which really comes through in Mark, are toned down in Matthew and Luke. Uh, the statement that Jesus was angry in Mark is omitted in Matthew and Luke. The argument from verbal agreement and, uh, and order. Um, there's the argument from the fact that when we have all three giving the same uh, story, there are many Mark-Luke agreements against Matthew, but few Matthew-Luke agreements against Mark. The fact that Matthew and Luke uh, never disagree in order against Mark is also evidence here. Uh, argument from literary agreements. Um, let me just go on and, and just, just list the, the rest of them. Arguments from redaction. Uh, the use of redaction criticism, Stein says, is an argument for Mark and priority. The argument from Mark's more primitive theology, it is said that Matthew's theology and uh, Luke's theology are more developed uh, than Mark. It seems then that Mark was probably written first. And uh, today, the vast majority of scholars believe that Mark was the first gospel to be written. But we need also to look here at Q material. Matthew and Luke at times have come the material that is not in Mark. There are 235 verses that are common to Luke and Mark and uh, Matthew, but don't appear in Mark. How do we explain that? At times, these agreements are virtually word for word, what appears in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. Um, where did that material come from? For the last hundred years or so, uh, scholars have proposed a, uh, a document called Q uh, from the German Quella, meaning source. We don't have a copy of Q. Q is a hypothetical document, uh, probably written, uh, but we don't actually have a copy of, of Q. There are a group of scholars today who have really um, studied Q and believe that uh, the Q is extremely important. Uh, they believe that they can see uh, different editions of Q in the various Gospels. They believe that there was a community of Christians that only had Q. Q doesn't go to the, uh, the passion and death and resurrection of Christ. So these kinds of scholars say, well, that wasn't important for them. All that was important was the teaching of Jesus. Uh, Really, I think that they're working out of their imagination more than anything else. Uh, I don't believe that there is evidence for what these scholars like James Robinson say about this supposed Q community. So this is the, the two-source hypothesis. So we have Mark and Q, Matthew and Luke, take their material from Mark and Q. So you can, I hope you can see the lines there drawn between uh, the documents. But now as we look at the, uh, the Gospels again, we see that Matthew has material that does not appear anywhere else. Luke has material that does not appear anywhere else. So this is unique material in Matthew and Luke. 
where did they get those? Well, it is proposed that they got them from other documents or uh, gospel traditions. What is unique to Matthew, we would call M. And what is unique to Luke, we would call L. So Matthew, according to this, used Mark, Q, and M to form his gospel. Luke used Mark, Q, and L to form his gospel. So this two-source or four-source hypothesis uh, are similar. So I'm just going to use the term two-source hypothesis to cover them both. Now, Tinney gives some weaknesses of the two-source hypothesis. There may have been personal interaction by the compilers of the Gospels, which would mean that maybe there wasn't a cue. Maybe uh, they got their material from each other. No trace of the Q document has ever been recovered, and that is true. The biggest problem for Mark and Priority is the existence of agreements in Matthew and Luke against Mark in the triple tradition. What this means is that there are places where all three of them have the same story, but Matthew and Luke agree against Mark. And here is an example. Telling about the, uh, the trial of Jesus. You see that they all have the same story, but Matthew and Luke have the people saying, who is it that struck you? Now, how do we explain that if we're using the two-source hypothesis? Generally, these are called minor agreements by those who hold to the two-source hypothesis. Those who don't hold to it uh, call, call them major disagreements. Um, perhaps it is a coincidence that they both happen to have uh, that in their, their tradition. So maybe M and L both had this. Perhaps there was an overlap between Mark and Q, and Matthew and Luke got it from Q. Uh, perhaps Mark simply omitted that phrase, and uh, they had a common source. So this is the two-document hypothesis. The two documents are Mark and Q. Matthew then used Mark and Q. Luke used Mark and Q. Matthew also used M, other materials, and uh, Luke used L, other materials for his gospel. Uh, most scholars today hold to this view of the synoptic problem. Okay, do you have questions or comments here before we go on? Okay, do you think you understand what we're saying here? Uh, Dr. Gallen? Yes. Return to a previous part uh, under common subject matter. Uh huh. Some facts about the synoptics and the second one, common use of language. I yes. don't know if it's important or not, but I couldn't get that number, 97.2% of mark. Where did you get it from? And the 88.4. Okay. Um, Matthew uses 97.2% of Mark's actual words. Yep. Okay. Um, what we have in this little chart that we gave you are yep. the, the, the verses of Mark oh, okay. that are being used. Uh, in terms of actual words, uh, according to uh, what I have read, it's 97.2%. Okay. Uh, and then Luke, it's 88.4%. Uh, All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. The point there is 
that Matthew and Luke use a lot of Mark in their, uh, their Gospels. Other questions, comments? All right. Let us go on then. Okay, the Farrer hypothesis, or some call this the Farrer Goulder Goodacre hypothesis. This hypothesis say, say that Mark was written first. Okay, so again, we have Mark in priority here, and that Matthew used Mark, and that Luke used Mark and Matthew. This has been called Mark and priority without Q. In the 1950s, Austin Farrer first proposed this theory. It was expanded in the 1980s by Michael Goulder. And today, the biggest proponent of this is uh, Mark Goodacre, professor of New Testament at Duke University. Now, it's based on two major premises. Number one, Luke used Matthew. And number two, Q did not exist. So uh, this gets rid of the use of Q, that hypothetical um, document. And now, it emphasizes the minor agreements of Matthew and Luke against Mark, and it says that there is evidence of Luke's use of Matthew, but not of Matthew's Luke, uh, use of Luke. Now, notice that both uh, the two-source hypothesis and the Farrer hypothesis are, have Mark in priority. They both believe that Mark was written first. Okay? So here, um, Mark is written first. Matthew then used Mark. And Luke used both Mark and Matthew. Okay? And then we have what's called the two gospel hypothesis, the Griesbach hypothesis. Uh, around the, uh, the year 1800, uh, Johann Jacob Griesbach proposed a theory that Matthew wrote first and was the basis for Luke. Mark then used Matthew and Luke to write his gospel. Uh, more recently, in the 1960s, William Farmer proposed the same hypothesis. He said that Matthew wrote first, then Luke used Matthew and his own unique sources in writing his gospel, and then Mark was a condensation of Matthew and Luke. But where Matthew and Luke have material in common, it is not Mark that condenses. And why would Mark delete the important parts of Matthew, like the Sermon on the Mount, and the important parts of Luke, like the Sermon on the Plain, and the important parts of both Matthew and Luke, like the infancy narratives and the post-resurrection experiences, uh, appearances? Um, now, again, like the Farrer hypothesis, the two gospel hypothesis has no need for Q. The identical passages in Matthew and Luke are explained by Luke's use of Matthew. We might also add that the early church as a whole uh, generally believed that Matthew was written first. So this hypothesis has some external evidence. Uh, in the early church, Matthew overshadowed uh, the other gospels, especially Mark. Why then did Mark want to make a short version of the gospel? This hypothesis says that there are apparent contradictions in Matthew and Luke, and Mark wanted to smooth them out 
for the sake of inquirers who may be turned away by the idea of contradiction. So this is the, the two document, uh, two gospel hypothesis. Okay, do you have questions or comments here? Uh, Dr. Galen, just a question here. Yes. The, sec the second hypothesis, uh, I, I couldn't get the name uh, quite right. It is Pharaoh's? Uh, Farer. Farer. Let's. It, it's not written there. It's, oh, it's not in here, huh? Okay, here, uh, the Farer oh, hypothesis. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Mm hmm. Other questions? Comments? Okay. All right. Um, it's time for a break. So let's take one right here and uh, take 10 minutes and we will resume shortly. All right, uh, let us go on to the, um, the next theory of the um, synoptic problem solution. And this is the orality and memory hypothesis or the theory of oral tradition. One version of this theory says that each of the gospel writers wrote what they heard orally. Matthew took his own notes uh, directly from Jesus. Mark reproduced the stories of Peter about Jesus, and Luke reproduced the uh, preaching of Paul. Now, certainly the accounts of Jesus' life and teaching were circulated orally uh, before they were written. But this theory does not seem to square with the facts of the interrelationship between the books. First of all, Luke tells us that he used written sources. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account, and that's a written source, of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those from whom the first uh, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Luke used written sources. Furthermore, you know, the sayings of Christ, we could understand uh, being verbatim, being exactly word for word from one place to another. But would the description of narrative come out exactly the same uh, to the three different writers writing at different times and places? You could imagine stories of Jesus uh, being uh, passed on verbatim, but the entire gospel story that would be required if, if it was oral. Uh, and another thing is that the order of the synoptics is generally the same. And Matthew and Luke never disagree against Mark. What are the odds that the order would be the same if it was all from oral traditions? Even details like parenthetical material, gives away the fact that uh, there was a common written source. And by this, I mean just off the cuff, um, casual sayings that appear there in the text. Um, in Matthew 24, 15, and Mark 13, 14 to 16, uh, a little phrase put in there let the reader understand. 
uh, how likely is it that that would appear at exactly that place if it were not written? In Luke 2, uh, 10, where it says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, how likely is that, uh, that this kind of abnormal construction that interrupts the quotation of Jesus would come out exactly word for word the same uh, if it were not written? Uh, now, many of those who hold to uh, this theory believe in it's a, a much more uh, complex process than this. Uh, here's a chart from Rainer Reisner. And you can see how complex he believes this whole process is. Now, uh, you don't need to memorize this, uh, but he just gives a very complex theory of how uh, the uh, Gospels came about. Here, the three synoptics are not dependent uh, on each other or on a Q document. The process depends on both oral and written documents and on informal notes that were taken during Jesus' ministry. I also want to mention uh, the Augustinian hypothesis. And this is that Matthew is written first, Mark used Matthew, and Luke used Matthew and Mark. So uh, Luke, in writing his gospel, drew on both Matthew and, and Mark. So here, the, the order in which they are written is the order in which we have our New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Uh, this doesn't have much of a following today. I want to give you one more possible uh, a theory, a solution to the synoptic problem, and that is Matthew's possible use of Mark and Luke. Uh, several scholars, such as Martin Hengel and N.T. Wright, have recently, recently proposed that Luke used Mark and then Matthew used Mark and Luke. <coughs> Excuse me. Even though this is not problem-free, it would solve several problems of the two and four source, uh, source hypothesis. Uh, it would not depend on Q uh, because the passages where Matthew and Luke are identical could be explained on Matthew's Luke of, uh, use of Luke. It would not rule out Q, but it would not make it necessary. It would also explain the agreements of uh, Matthew and Luke against Mark in the triple tradition. Uh, very similar to the Farer uh, uh, solution, but uh, a different order of the books. So those are the options. The majority of scholars today hold to the two or four document hypothesis that uh, Matthew and Luke used Mark and Q plus their own unique sources. Okay, do you have questions or comments about the synoptic problem? Yes, sir, I have a question. Yes, Gustavo. It's, it's kind of bugging my mind. Okay. If you mentioned earlier that, um, which one is it? That the early church uh, kind of followed the two gospel hypotheses, is, if I understood well, I think it's that one. So, and, and we have, and we have in our Bible, Bible studies and all those things, we use the early church's great theorem to 
as as uh, evidences and things like that. Why then is that idea that Matthew was not written first, not held uh, as strong as before? How that has changed when since the early church used it? Uh, okay, um, by early church, we are talking about up to around the year 600. So that, that is usually what the term early church means. So oh, we're, we're, okay. we're not talking first century necessarily. So um, it's not first century church, it's more like the, okay. Yeah, it later makes on. Sense now. Okay, now it makes so sense. <laughs> in, in the early centuries of the church, it was generally believed that Matthew was written first. Um, that, that I, I think that was the point that I was making there. Oh, okay, but thank you for the clarification because it, it kind of confused me a little bit. If in the early, right now that you clarify what early church means, okay, but it's not the first century church then, right? Or second century church, right? Um, oh. Math, Matthew probably wasn't written until the second half of the first century, and uh, well. Probably all of them were written in the second half of the first century, some earlier, some later. Uh, John, uh, probably toward the end of the uh, first century. Um, okay. But yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay, how about if I say that in order to pass the course, you have to ask at least one question or make one comment in the in uh, this course. How would that be? I have one. Because I have not heard from some of you at all. Yeah. I assume that you have ears and can hear and that you're listening. Okay. Uh, but I would also like to hear from you. I know that this is a uh, monologue to a certain extent here, and I would like to uh, have a dialogue if possible. Okay. All right, uh, Miles. Yeah, uh, doctor, I just have uh, some confusion, <laughs> need clarification. When okay. we say who wrote, uh, who wrote it first, uh, is it based from the occurrence? When did it happen or they were all eyewitnesses of the thing. And it just so happened that, you know, Mark or, you know, did it first before Matthew or, you know, yeah, Luke. Because okay. uh, when it was written, something like that. Mm -hmm. The only eyewitness of the, the three synoptic writers would be Matthew. Mm, okay. So he may have taken his own notes during the life of Christ. Uh, okay. Mark and Luke were one step away. Mark, excuse me, and we'll get this when we get to those gospels. Mm -hmm. Mark uh, reproduced the preaching of Peter. And Luke was the companion of Paul. So he heard uh, Paul's preaching he also did research. So he was there uh, when the church began. He, he was there probably. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know when he became a Christian. I know on Paul's second missionary journey, he joined Paul in Troas. Uh, but how long before that he had been a Christian, uh, you know, we just don't know. But he did research. He tells us that in uh, Luke chapter 1. So he used eyewitness reports, even though he himself was not an eyewitness. Mark lived in Jerusalem and may have witnessed some of the events of Christ, uh, but we, know ha we have no record of that. Mark's home was used by the early church and perhaps even the day of Pentecost. Uh, could have happened in Mark's home. Okay. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Then okay. maybe for me now it's Matthew <laughs> because <it's, laughs> it seems he's quite lazy to do it for us, and Mark is more concise. <laughs> okay. Now what we're talking about is the time that their books were written. 
-hmm. So from using uh, analyzing, analyzing the gospels, it appears that Mark was written first. Mm -hmm. And even though in the early centuries of the church, uh, they thought that Matthew was written first, but uh, probably not. Probably Mark was written first. Um, and then, then Matthew or Luke sometime after that. Dr. Gay Galen. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> it just makes me wonder, probably this question has been raised and still not answered, but why would a eyewitness like Matthew, who would walk with the Lord for so many years, would use Mark, who is not an eyewitness, to write his own account? That, uh, that is an excellent question. And when we get to Matthew, we're going to deal with it. You know, okay. In fact, <laughs> I, I, I already have that question uh, in my notes. You know, why would he do that kind of thing? So let's just put it off till then. Fair enough. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, so Sorry, here... Doctor, just one. Uh, yes. Because when I'm reading, really, the gospel, I'm really wondering why all the repetition of these things, you know? <laughs> why, why they just can't put it into one, especially when they, the, when they can canonize the book, you know, the writing? Why didn't uh -huh. they decide on you know extracting here and there rather than uh, having four authors or people and different four sets? Why didn't they write a harmony, right? Yeah, a harmony <laughs> of the gospels. <laughs> yeah, uh, there was a man by the name of uh, Tatian who wrote uh, a harmony of the gospels that was used in uh, Syria. It was written in Syriac. Uh, called the Dia Tesseron, and um, it was used for centuries, but then eventually it was no longer used, and um, so that, I guess, there was an experiment along those lines, but the church opted for the four Gospels as they were written originally. Okay, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we will end our treatment of the synoptic problem right there. And uh, so this, this that we've been talking about is source criticism, okay? Source criticism. And uh, the one aspect that we've been dealing with is the synoptic problem. Now we're going to go to a second kind of criticism called form criticism. Uh, the practice of form criticism actually began with Old Testament uh, studies by Hermann Gunkel and Hugo Gressman. Gunkel developed the uh, JEDP theory of the sources for the Old Testament. The pioneer of uh, form criticism in the New Testament was Martin de Baileus, and it was largely promoted by Rudolf Bultmann. It attempts to go back to the oral period to discover the particular stories, we call these pericope, um, the reason that they were put into the Gospels. It stresses heavily the life situation of the church. Now, theologians use this German phrase, sitz im Leben, meaning life situation. So I thought I would throw it in here because you will probably run across that phrase. Sitzem Leben means life situation. The New Testament, uh, New Testament criticism has to do with three life settings or Sitzem Leben. The life of Jesus, that is the focus of source criticism. The early church is the focus of form criticism, and the gospel writer or the evangelist is the focus of redaction criticism. 
redaction criticism we will look at next. Most evangelicals, including myself, reject most of the conclusions of form criticism. Let's say, first of all, that the, the uh, practice of it is not necessarily bad. It may be helpful, but the problem is that those who used it primarily uh, went in with a anti-supernaturalistic bias. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe that Jesus was the son of God uh, in a, a um, in an ontological kind of way, that he was the uh, second person of the Trinity. So um, that is the problem with it. In terms of method, uh, most of those who develop form criticism believe that Jesus was not the Son of God, but a radical, perhaps deluded, apocalyptic, who thought the world was going to end immediately. They also rejected the supernaturalistic Jesus that they saw in the Gospels. So they had to explain how the human Jesus of history was transformed into this supernatural God-man of the Gospels. Since this happened in the period of oral transmission of the accounts, their task was determined to determine how that process happened. The method of form criticism is to analyze the stories of the New Testament and discover how they came into being during the oral period of transmission of the teaching about Jesus before the Gospels were written. Now, probably everyone agrees that there was at least some kind of oral period um, in the transmission of the stories of the Gospels. This doesn't mean that there couldn't have been written accounts alongside the oral tradition. And even after the Gospels were written, uh, people still continued to uh, listen to the oral tradition, to pass it along. Now, form critics uh, generally believe that there was a long period of oral transmission and that the Gospels were written in the last few years of the first century. The reason that they give is that the early church uh, didn't see any need to write the accounts down because they thought Jesus was coming back immediately and uh, they had eyewitnesses to what happened. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but when they began to realize that Jesus wasn't coming back immediately, then they uh, decided they better write down the stories about his life. Um, actually, uh, these uh, arguments probably won't hold water uh, because the belief in the early church that Jesus was going to come back immediately um, has really been contested. And it seems that uh, they were writing about Jesus' life at an early time and not just at a late time. The, this exclusively oral period may have been much shorter than what those who hold a form criticism say. The form criticism uh, critics say that the sayings of Jesus had no settings. In other words, they were just sayings with no context. So the evangelist made up a setting to fit the saying. The form critics also believe that the stories of Jesus, the pericopes, were transmitted as separate detached units with no chronology. The gospel writers then put them together in the order that we now have. Their role was collectors rather than authors. The exception to this was the passion narrative, which has a chronological sequence. Uh, the pericopes, these stories or paragraphs, uh, are uh, classified in different ways. And I will just give you these classifications by three different form critics. 
Um, and uh, as you go across, these all mean the same thing. Martin de Balius has paradigms, Rudolf Moltmann, apothegms, <laughs> however you say that, who knows, uh, and pronouncement stories in Vincent Taylor. Uh, we have novellen, miracle stories, miracle stories, Perinesis or sayings, sayings and parables in Taylor. Debalius has legends, Boltman historical stories, Vincent Taylor stories about Jesus, and uh, Debalius myths, Boltman legends. Um, I'm not going to go into the nature of, of all of these categories, but they believe that the uh, purpose of these stories is shown in the kind of form that it takes. Um, so the form of the stories tells the function that it had in the early church. A key point is that the form critics, uh, or that the form critics makes, is that it was the church that gave shape to these stories. The moderate form critic would say that the needs of the church determined which stories and teachings of Jesus' life were retained. Uh, after all, Jesus did a lot of things. Not all of it is written down in the Gospels. In fact, John said that if every one of them were written down, he said, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So from the mass of material about Jesus, certain stories and sayings were selected, and a, uh, a more moderate form critic would look at the early church and say, what was it that caused them to select this? But the more radical form critics, such as Bultmann, <laughs> say that the church actually created the sayings to meet the need. Boltman says that it was the sayings of Christian <laughs> prophets that were put into the mouth of the historical Jesus so that we cannot get back to the very words of Jesus. Uh, of course, that doesn't swear, square with the evidence of the New Testament. Nowhere does it indicate that prophets did such a thing. Paul clearly distinguished between his writings and the sayings of Jesus, even though he saw himself speaking uh, as the uh, authority, with the authority that came from Christ. So this is basically how form criticism works. When it analyzes a story in the Gospels, it asks, what life situation Sitzem Leben, of the early church would have necessitated a story like this. Uh, for example, in Matthew 16, 17 to 19, it says, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, the more radical form critics, such as Bultmann, would say that this story was invented by the church in order to justify its existence because uh, according to Jesus, the world did not come to an end immediately. Uh, a more moderate form critic uh, would say, uh, like Vincent Taylor, would say that the delayed return of Jesus was an issue in the church, and so the church valued this saying of Jesus and retained it, and that is why it's in the Gospels. So for the form critic, the focus is not on Jesus, but it's on the church. To say that the needs of the church determine the stories of the Gospels needs to be evaluated carefully. 
there are sayings of Jesus in the Gospels that did not meet any apparent needs of the church, and in fact, they were called hard sayings. Sayings that are hard to understand, such as, I tell you the truth, some are standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Uh, that could easily have been dropped out of the Gospels when the Gospels were written, because it's a hard saying. How do we understand that? And what about, why do you call me good? There is no one good except God alone. Or, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Rather, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, this was included in the Gospels at the height of the Gentile mission. If they were going to eliminate something, surely they would have eliminated those things. We also see that there were issues in the church that are not reflected in any of Christ's sayings. The issue of circumcision, for example, was a crucial issue in the early church but we have no saying of Jesus about it. Other issues such as speaking in tongues and spiritual gifts, these were issues at the time that the Gospels were written, and yet we have no sayings of Jesus about them. So as we said, for the form critics such as Boltman, the focus was not on Jesus, but on the early church. Uh, but in fact, Bultmann said that Jesus was so hidden behind uh, the writings of the early church that we can know hardly anything about Jesus. The only thing that we can know is that he lived and was crucified. Other than that, uh, Bultmann draws a blank on any of the details about Jesus' life. For Bultmann, using form criticism can get us back to the process of how and why the church created the stories about Jesus. Um, and like I said, less radical form critics would say that it will help us determine why the early church retained certain stories of Jesus and did not retain others. Uh, even these laws of oral transmission that form critics use have been called into question. According to the more radical form critics, especially Boltman, modern man cannot accept the supernatural stories of the Bible. Uh, they say, you know, we live in a secular age. If people are going to accept the stories of the Bible, then we are going to have to uh, take the myths out, demythologize these stories. Uh, let me just pause here and say there are a lot of people who I can't see, and I need to see you. So could you go ahead and turn on your cameras? Unless, unless the rapture happens, I want to see you, okay? Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, now for Bultmann, myth is the report of an occurrence or an event in which supernatural, superhuman forces or persons are at work. So, um, like I, I might have mentioned before, it's like, uh, it's like a uh, stalk of wheat growing in the field. Uh, that stalk comes up and there is an, on the outside, there is an outer husk, the part that you don't want. You wanna get rid of that. Inside is the kernel. This is what you want to keep. And um, so you get rid of the, the husk, which is like the story and you keep the kernel, which is like the, uh, the eternal truth. 
So let me let me just try to illustrate it. If I can if I can do this, if we can make a little timeline. Okay, pretend that's a straight line. And uh, here is where Christ is. And here is the place that the Gospels are written. Sorry, sir, we can't see anything. You can't see anything. Okay, then I, okay, hold on. Um, we only see you. Well, that's the most important thing now, isn't it? Just kidding. Okay, we'll start over here. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what happened there. Let's try it again. Okay, uh, this, this is our timeline. Can you see that? Can you see it? Okay. Uh, here's the time of Christ. And here's the time when the Gospels are written. Here we have the oral period. So the uh, form criticism focuses in on the oral period and the time that the Gospels were written. And it tries to figure out why certain stories and sayings were retained. Now, being anti-supernaturalistic, that is not believing in miracles, um, Boltman's illustration of the, the wheat is like this. On the outer side, we have the husk, that outer part that you don't want. That is the myth. So the myth is the story. The inner part, this is the kernel. And this is the eternal truth. That is the part that you want. So you want to get rid of the husk and you want to keep the, uh, the kernel, the eternal truth. So the, uh, the husk is the story. Uh, as, an, as an illustration, uh, Jesus calms the storm on the sea. Uh, Boltman would say, well, you know, we are sophisticated people. We don't believe in, in uh, miracles like that. We're scientific. So we're going to not accept that um, because, you know, that, that didn't really happen because miracles can't happen. But there must be a, an eternal truth that uh, we can get from this story. And for him, the eternal truth is that when we're having a storm in our life, our hearts are battered by the winds of, of uh, uh, trouble and uh, we are depressed and we don't know what to do and confusion and all, that we can go to Jesus and Jesus can calm the storm in our hearts. Um, now, you can use that as an illustration of how Jesus does calm the storm in our hearts, but we're going to retain the story. Uh, it actually happened. There was a boat on the sea. If you had a video camera, you could record it. There was a storm. Jesus said, peace be still, and it stopped. Um, that is the essence of what the gospel writer is saying. 
And uh, if we want to use that as an illustration for another point, we can do that. But we're not going to demythologize. We're not going to get rid of the myth because we don't believe in miracles. Because in fact, God does do miracles. Jesus did miracles when he was on earth. And those are recorded in the Gospels. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie entitled Ever After, but uh, it's a story of Cinderella, and it's a demythologized version of Cinderella. It takes all of the myth out of that, that famous, uh, Cinderella is a famous story in Western culture. Uh, if you've seen that, that's an example of demythologizing. Uh, so according to Boltman, <coughs> um, we, uh, we have to demythologize the stories that we see in the Gospels. Not only is it just the events, uh, the stories that we see in the Gospels for Boltman, but all of the gospel, the core of the gospel for Bultmann has to be demythologized. And that includes the fall of man, the atoning death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the last judgment. Bultmann says all of these need to be demythologized. Excuse me. But you know, if there is no supernatural, there is no gospel. Um, Boltman goes on to offer what is called an existential theology. So the really important uh, way that we use the, the uh, New Testament is to have it help us make the right decisions. He says that we need to live authentic lives. That is, the life that we live needs to be uh, reflected, uh, it needs to reflect our innermost feelings. And if it doesn't, then we are being hypocritical and we are inauthentic. So the life that we live needs to come from our uh, our um, most believed uh, beliefs down deep inside, our gut feelings. We need to live that out. And that is being authentic. That is following the example of Christ because he believed so much in what he, uh, what he believed that he was willing to let it take him to the cross. The problem is, what should we believe? And Boltman has nothing to say on that. Um, he gives no content to what we ought to believe. So if we are Adolf Hitler and we believe we ought to kill six million Jews, well, you know, whatever you believe, you know, you got to be authentic. Uh, well, you know, I don't think so. Uh, certainly, uh, the New Testament, the teachings of Christ, the gospel tells us how we ought to live. Uh, so let me uh, go out of this. And we will go back. Let's look at the evaluation of um, form criticism. Form critics have not allowed enough room for the sheer biographical interest that early Christians must, must have had in Jesus. Don't you think that the Christians of the early church wanted to know about the life of Christ? Um, certainly they would have. Christianity is Christ. He is the center. He is the focus. To think that his followers would not care about his life is, is crazy nor have foreign critics allowed for the possibility that the gospel tradition 
uh, was, uh, was preserved because it was true as well as useful for Christian evangelism, teaching, and liturgy. You know, mythology doesn't develop in an instant, and yet that is what the form critics are uh, asking us to believe. Form critics seem also to have forgotten that both Christian and anti-Christian eyewitnesses of Jesus' career must have deterred wholesale fabrication and distortion of information. There were people who could say, I was there. I can tell you what happened. I can verify that this story is true. And so, um, so it can be verified or not verified by eyewitnesses. Uh, let me just quickly finish here. Nor was, must we think that all ancient people gullibly accepted every tale of the supernatural they heard. Uh, they were much more sophisticated than we give them credit for at times. We also need to look at the early evidence for the formation of the Gospels from church history. And uh, we have an, uh, a quote here from Papias telling how uh, Mark wrote his gospel, taking it from the uh, sermons of Peter. If this is true, then it really nullifies all the form criticism because it goes back uh, beyond the oral period. And we have an eyewitness telling what went into that gospel. Gundry says, if the Gospels are not reliable, we draw a blank on the beginning of Christianity. But the dramatic upsurge of Christianity demands an explanation equal to the phenomenon. A.M. Hunter says, if early Christian faith created the Gospel record, what created the Christian faith? Um, and let me just say that um, Today, in America and most of the West, form criticism is not held to uh, very closely uh, anymore. It used to very much. But in places like Germany, it is still, uh, it still holds sway in New Testament scholarship. All right, uh, we will stop here, and we will take up here next time. God bless you. Have a great uh, two days, and we will see you on Friday morning. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. God bless you. God bless you.